So let's talk about type two diabetes for a second, because, well, one, I wanted to find out how come, because I guess you and Dr. Fung, you and Dr. Fung really got into nephrology, which is the study of kidneys. And how did that because you guys have kind of seen like you've moved over into really being like an expert in like type two diabetes. And yeah. I'd like you to talk about, you know, if you have type two diabetes, is it safe and to do fasting and will it help you lose weight and cl control your blood sugar and address the fact that the American Diabetes Association has made a statement that they don't re recommend fasting as a technique for diabetes management, even though we have hundreds and thousands of cases of people doing phenomenal and getting reversing type 2 diabetes from fasting. Yeah. Um, so first we got in, uh, we sort of transitioned specialties a little bit because there was virtually no patients with type uh, diabetic kidney disease. Um, so dia diabetes, type 2 diabetes can cause kidney disease and kidney failure. And, um, you know, 30 years ago, there were very rare cases of diabetic kidney disease. And then over the span of about 10 years, it became a catastrophe, a complete epidemic. We were, all these people were coming in, in droves. Like you, there were job openings for nephrologists all over the place here in North America. Um, because diabetes, it was happening earlier on in life. You know, people weren't getting it now in their 70s. They were getting it in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s. And it was there long enough to actually start to cause kidney damage and kidney failure. Um, we went from having the dialysis unit open a little bit with a few patients a couple times a week or a few times a week to being open seven days a week, running 24 seven and going up to about 1200 people that we would dialyze a day. Um, and most of that's due to the diabetes epidemic. And as diabetes gets worse, kidney disease gets worse and there's nothing you can do about it as kidney experts. So Dr. Fung would have these patients come in with diabetic kidney disease and he'd have to tell them that, well, if their diabetes gets worse, he can't do anything for them. Sorry. You know, we can talk about dialysis options and transplant options. Mm. Like what, what kind of life is that? And if you're a type two diabetic, your life expectancy, at least here in Ontario, where Jason and I live is three years on dialysis. So unless you have a donor, or you get, uh, get lucky on the transplant list, you're screwed. So that's how we got into this. Um, so we primarily started fasting with type two diabetics and our first pilot, like all of our diabetic patients were off of uh, their insulin within a month. Within six months, they were all off of all of their or all of their diabetic medications. And so, like many of them, like I still see them in clinic. Many, many of them to this day are still off of everything. We're going like eight years later now. So people that were on insulin, you know, for thirty years, some of them were on it longer than I had been alive at the time, and. Now they're off of it. They're going in a decade of being off of it is simply through fasting. So you can absolutely, we published a case series in the British Medical Journal, uh, BMJ cases, um, highlighting three of our patients. And it's just, it's phenomenal for type two diabetic patients. I think the biggest thing that scares organizations like the AMA or sorry, the ADA um, is that if you're on medications that can make you go hypoglycemic, you can run into it, it, fasting, you could become hypoglycemic. It can be potentially life threatening. So if you're not um, adjusting insulin or medications like sulfonylureas um, uh, and you don't have a doctor who's doing that while you're fast, you, you do put yourself at risk. So we always recommend to people that you work with a doctor or will recommend a doctor in their area that will support them through, uh, through fasting so they can have their medications adjusted appropriately. So that's for the more sick diabetic patients. There are other medications that don't run the risk of hypoglycemia. So they're really not, um, not that problematic. And so that's one medical concern I think they have. And then there's all of the political stuff and the business stuff, right? Like who are the biggest sponsors of the ADA? Um, well, you know, pharma plays a large role in sponsoring these organizations. And, you know, if we're taking everybody off of medication, well, how does that affect pharma's bottom line? 
So there's a lot of political stuff. I was working with the dean of a very important in medical school, like one of the top 20 medical schools in the entire world. And uh, they were doing phenomenal. And I talked to them and I said, you know, like, let's bring this. Like, you know, let me teach about it. Let me give a lecture about it. We, year one, year two, year three, whatever. Um, but like, let's talk about it. Like, I was so excited for her to get these amazing results. And then she said to me, you know, Megan, I can't. Like, I can't have you come to my school. Like, mm. our, our, new oncolo our new endocrinology building was just paid by X company that produces this, you know, massively consumed diabetic medication. She's like, politically, I just can't have you there. Sorry. Wow. Um, so, like, it's, like, there's, there's a lot of, lot of nonsense, too. Mm. There are some genuine concerns for people's well-being, but there's some nonsense as well. I'd love for you guys to go to our Facebook group, the Intermittent Fasting and OMAD group. We're doing a sleep contest. We want to see how your sleep is doing. And if you've been out having fun and it's time to get your health routine back, then sleep is a really, really big part of it. And so we're going to do a little bit of a sleep contest. Go if you've got like an aura ring or something like that, you can post how much you're sleeping, but sleep is so key. It's the one thing that I feel like I've got so dialed in. And the only reason is because of my favorite product, which is the Magnesium Breakthrough by Bio Optimizers. It's the only one that contains seven forms of magnesium and it helps you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. It's a total game changer, and just so you know, it's a 100% money back guarantee. So if you don't love it, just return it, get all your money back. But I'm getting you 10% off. So go to magbreakthrough.com slash wasteaway, enter the code wasteaway for 10% off any order, and this special offer is only available at magbreakthrough.com slash wasteaway. Don't forget to put wasteaway for 10% off. So talk a little bit about you personally. Um, like how long have you been doing intermittent fasting? What type of eating window do you prefer? And talk to us about your extended fasting. What's the longest amount of time that you've gone and any tips that have kind of helped you through it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've, uh, I reverse all my conditions doing three fasting days a week. I committed to myself to do three fasting days a week, ranging from 24 to 42 hours, depending on social life and how I was feeling that day. If I wasn't feeling well, then I would only pressure myself to do 24 hours. Um, and if I had a social thing, I wouldn't exclude myself because and I would do 24 hours. Um, but eventually 24 hours doesn't even feel like a fast when you do it so consistently. So 42 is more of my mainstay. And then that last little bit of body fat was a real big pain to lose. So I did a series of three day and five day fast over the course of a month just to shake it off and get rid of it once and for all. Um, so that's what I did. Um, currently, my fasting, I, I do an eight or 16 to 18 hour fast daily. Um, every now and then, uh, I'll do a longer fast um, to change things up. Um, I often, a few times a week, end up doing 24 or 36 because I end up getting pretty busy. But I do travel a lot for work. I'm eating out at restaurants. I still eat really well, but you never know what kind of inflammatory fats. I had a steakhouse recently. Recently, I saw them put vegetable oil down on the grill before they threw the steaks on them. Um, so I, I still like to do these intermittent fasts uh, when they fit my schedule. So if I have a busy day that I can't eat, I just embrace it and choose to do a fast that day. Um, four times a year, I think of it as seasonal cleaning, I'll do a five to seven day fast. So like after the December holidays, we roll into like true winter in January, I'll, I'll do a seven day fast as winter cleaning. And I'll repeat that in the spring, in the summer, and the fall. So it's usually somewhere between five to seven days. I always aim for seven. Sometimes work travel gets in the way a little bit, uh, and it ends up being five. The longest fast I've personally ever done has been 11 days. Um, the biggest lesson I learned from it is that sodium intake is more critical at the start of the fast. A lot of people think at the start of the fast they're going to be okay and they need to worry about sodium later on. 
where it's the first few days of the fast where you see the most dramatic drop in insulin. And when you see that dramatic drop in insulin, you lose a lot of water and you'll lose a lot of sodium as a result. Whereas, you know, day four, day five, day six, and so on and so forth into the fast, you don't see that huge crash in insulin and you're not going to the bathroom all of the time. So you're really not at risk of accidentally depleting yourself of sodium. So that, that immediately, that was a first lesson I learned from that extended fast is, okay, you need to make sure you're topping up with salts, whether it's salt in water, salt on my tongue, or I'm having sugar-free pickle juice or uh, bone broth, but I'm really embracing that the first three days of the fast. The longest water fast, that's a water and salt fast that's been done in clinic um, was 40 days. Um, we had one person and do a modified uh, fast to a certain extent for, oh, no, no, actually our longest one is now 60, 61 days. Um, she did consume broth once a week, um, but otherwise it was water and salt for the rest of it. And then the second longest was 40. We've had a bunch of people do 21 and 28 day fast too over the years. So if you've been enjoying the show, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're listening to. Take a screenshot of it and email it to questions at chantelrayway.com. The first 15 people who do that will get an amazing free gift. You will get an exclusive interview of the Thin Eaters and what they do to stay thin and make sure they stay in trim top shape. Go to Apple Podcasts, take a snapshot of it, email it to questions at chantelrayway.com and I'll send you your gift. And if you don't feel like making the review and you want to pay $79 to get this video, it is well worth it. Just go to ChantelRayway.com and download it and buy it. Awesome. So with the salt and the sodium, what do you suggest? Like, let's say someone says, look, I'm feeling dehydrated. I'm starting to feel weak. I'm doing a longer fast. What does that look like for them? So like, are you taking like a pink Himalayan sea salt, putting it under your tongue? Are you putting some salt in their water? What do you think is the easiest way for them to get that sodium in? Yeah. I mean, their bone broth is a, a can be a romantic process to make it. Um, Sugar-free pickle juice can sometimes be a quick and dirty way to get some salt into your system. But I hear in Canada, we're spoiled. It's everywhere here. Apparently, um, to our friends uh, south of the border in the U.S., it's very not very common uh, here. So that's not necessarily the easiest route. Um, so, you know, less than 20% of the population is actually salt sensitive. Um, but you need to make sure that you're not in that, you know, 18% of the population that is salt sensitive. So make sure you check, check it out or you listen to your body. I always think it's better to start off slowly with salt. So like a quick and dirty way to get salt into your system is just to sprinkle about a quarter of a teaspoon on your tongue and chase it with water. That tends to be the most effective. You could also mix it in with water. That sometimes makes people feel nauseous. They actually get less nauseous just putting it on their tongue and then chasing it with water. Um, and then taking a quarter of a teaspoon, you know, three or four times throughout the day and test whether you get a lot of swelling, whether your blood pressure goes up. Um, if you don't, then chances are is you're probably not too sensitive. But of course, always check with your doctor. Um, we... If we have a patient in our clinic who is not salt sensitive, um, you know, we sort of recommend them taking, you know, one to two teaspoons total worth of salt through the day, but definitely not all at once. There's lots of negative effects of taking that much sodium, and lots of diarrhea, the heart palpitations, uh, feeling uh, com completely fatigued. So we'll usually have people take a quarter of a teaspoon throughout the day. Most people find that every few hours they need a quarter of a teaspoon um, to help them. And most people, you know, if they're doing an extended fast, usually by the end of day three, their body's fully burning body fat. So they're getting lots of ketone bodies for fuel from their body fat. And they they're losing a lot less water and they don't really need to even be all that mindful about sodium too much at that point. Um, so, so salt on your tongue tends to be the most effective way. In the United States, you can actually get Himalayan salt capsules. So a lot of the doctors that I work mm. with in the U.S., they'll just keep them in their pocket because it's just really easy just to 
take a couple and then chase it with some water and it's less gross and there's no nausea that way. Um, so that is a preferred method for Ooh, all I of the doctors that. I've worked with. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You are so much fun to talk to. I always love talking to you. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow your work. Yeah, absolutely. So you can check us out at thefastingmethod.com. All of our social links are up there too on Instagram and Twitter. You can find me at Megan J. Ramos for my personal personal profiles as well. And we have a Facebook group called the Obesity Code Network with Dr. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos. Awesome. And everyone else, stay tuned because we have another amazing uh, episode coming right up 